morning. We are here with our football officiating legend, and that is Mr. Jerry Markbright, who is a longtime NFL referee, one of the most recognizable referees probably in the history of the NFL, and certainly an absolute treasure to officiating, to football, and uh, basically just to the world as a human being. Good morning, Jerry. Thank you for being here with us this Thank morning. You. We'll jump into the interview. The uh, first question for you is, what role did interscholastic athletics play in your life growing up? Well, interscholastic sports uh, really gave me a great taste of officiating. Uh, I joined the Illinois High School Association uh, right out of college uh, and started my officiating uh, on the frosh uh, soft level uh, and uh, got hooked. And uh, I remained a member of the uh, Illinois High School Association for almost 40 years. And uh, it gave me a chance to find out that I was good at something. I never thought I was getting good at anything. And all of a sudden, officiating appeared. So knowing that, uh, what actually made you to decide to become an official? Well, my old high school coach, a man named Elliot Hassan, who was a coach in the Big Ten, I mean, an official in the Big Ten, and he was a field judge, and he was my idol. Uh, I played for him, and he knew how much I love football. He said, when you go to college, try your hand at officiating, and if if you like it, when you come home, I'll take you up to the local officials association and we'll get you started. Well, I went to Illinois, uh, tried to play football and got killed. And finally, uh, someone said, why don't you try? One of my professors said, you know, there's an officiating class. Why don't you take it? So I did. And then the instructor said, why don't you go down and see if you can officiate intramural football? And I was 19 years old. I went down to the office, interviewed. The guy said, have you done any officiating? I said, no, I played a lot of football, four years of high school, a year here. He said, uh, do you know any of the rules? I said, no. He reached in the drawer, he took out, took out a flag a whistle and a rule book. And he said, you've got a game at three o'clock. I said, you gotta be kidding. I don't know anything. He said, the guy you're working with doesn't know any more than you do. Good luck. And that started my 60 year career on the football field. And uh, it, uh, it fulfilled my life. It, it was the most important thing going out there or working flag football, uh, didn't know anything about it and got hooked. And that was, that's the beginning of the story. Yeah, you know, I do have to say after hearing that, I'm really glad that training of officials has improved since then, uh, throwing them, uh, I would, and them on the field. <laughs> well, that's right. Of course they were, they were starved for officials uh, for intramural sports. And they paid a big $3 a game. And I said, uh, at the time, that was a lot of money. And he said, uh, the good news, you get $3 a game. The bad news is we don't pay it till the end of the season. <laughs> I said, okay, that's a fine. I think I got a check for $21 or something. It was great. you never seen so much money in one check before. No. So, you know, you and I have talked about this in the past, and, and I know um, you have a long career in officiating, but what is your most memorable moment of your on-field officiating career? There have been many, but I, I have to say that uh, getting four Super Bowls together was probably the most important thing. Uh, only because to get a Super Bowl, you have to be the top rated official at your position. And there are 17 referees in the NFL and the number one referee in that 
of that for that particular year gets a Super Bowl assignment unless he had it the previous year. So I, fortunately, I got four Super Bowls. And uh, when I stood there for the national anthem for the fourth one, I cried. And I, why am I crying? Well, I don't know. I just, I couldn't believe it was me out there running a Super Bowl game. Uh, I thought back to the B'nai B'rith Touch Football League where, uh, where I got $3 a game uh, and, and was happy to get it. And here I was in front of 100 million people working a Super Bowl game. That, that was probably one of those, how did I get here moments where you're just, uh, this, it's still, I would imagine as an NFL official and starting where you had started, probably every game was one of those moments where it was just surreal. Like what, how am I here? What have, how did I, how did I become one of the lucky ones? So um, we talked a little bit about your on the field officiating career. What would you say is your most memorable experience off of the field, but still as it relates to officiating? Well, the thing I learned about officiating was that uh, all of the nuances of officiating, the things that make you special and that make you really good come from other people. It's not in the rule book. It's from the mentors that take an interest in you and teach you things that nobody else would teach you. And so I got the message. What I officiated, I helped the local officials association. When I retired, I spent all the years that I could paying back officiating by giving all of the nuances and all of the suggestions that were fed to me to other officials. And I've been fortunate enough, uh, Bill Carollo, who was the head of uh, the Big Ten, the Mid-American and the uh, Missouri Valley Conference, uses me as an advisor for young referees. And I, I am able year after year to impart all of the things that I learned uh, that make for good refereeing. And I did the same thing for the National Football League for 18 years after retiring. It's as rewarding as you could possibly imagine to teach the young referees and watch them perform and watch them do things that you taught them. And you treat them uh, with dignity and you feel that they're like your children because uh, they give a signal a certain way, they say something a certain way. It came from you, but it really didn't come from me. It came from the guy that taught me how to do it and the guy that taught him how to do it. So it's a never ending chain of information, pass it on. A lot of these things don't occur, don't happen once in a year, once in a lifetime. But I remember them because I was taught and I pass it on to them. And almost invariably every year, one of these things happen. And there, and someone would call me and say, boy, we talked about this 10 years ago, it finally happened and I knew what to do. That's the reward really. It's as rewarding after you officiate as it was officiating. And the only thing you don't have to worry about is getting a downgrade because I'm not on the field anymore. That, that's really amazing to think about how your, how your legacy lives on through those who learn from you, from, for those who learn from whoever you mentored. It, it kind of gives you a, a sense of officiating immortality almost. I think there's something really special about that where you can see pieces of you in two generations removed of officials. That's just such a special part of it that I don't think we think about enough. Well, you know, Dana, when you say that, uh, I think back to my old high school coach uh, and official mentor who told me one day, he said, if you like officiating, if you put everything into it, he said, you could do it for most of your adult life. 
And I thought to myself, here I am, a 19-year-old kid, my all adult life. What is he kidding? Well, I walked off the field at almost 64 years old. Most of my adult life, I'm now going to be 87 years old, and I'm still involved with football. He was right. Almost all of my adult life, minus 18 years, has been football. All I am is an old football. And I got a bunch of old ones in my cabinet to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that's amazing. Um, and I think sometimes when we're young, you don't think about how far it's going to take you. And in the moment, it's just something you're doing in your spare time or it's a hobby. And then, you know, fast forward over 60 years and you're still active in it. It's just, uh, I'm sure in a lot of ways it's gone by in the blink of an eye. So that's really an incredible story. Um, if you were speaking with a newer official who was considering quitting officiating, what would you maybe tell them to keep them in the game? Well, first of all, most young officials that start get discouraged because uh, in today's age, everybody wants to get to the top immediately. They want to go from uh, high school to the National Football League. What I tell them is stick with it. It will give you the most wonderful things in your life if you work hard and stick with it. If you quit it, you're never going to know how good you really were at, at officiating. And, you know, how do you find out how good you are? You take a chance and you stay with it and you move to the next level. And when you get a shot at the next level, even though you're afraid that maybe you're not good enough to make that next level, you try it anyway. And then you amaze yourself to find that you are good enough. An old official once said, there's room at the top in all professions, especially officiating, where everyone is climbing the ladder. But at the very top, there's a lot of room for a lot of people that are good at officiating. And if you work hard, you can get to the top. And he was right. I mean, here I am, a a little nobody from Skokie, Illinois, thinking about a Super Bowl game. I thought about my next assignment at a, a private school where I got $15. That was a big deal for me. So if they quit, if they, first of all, it's hard to get them to even try it. But if they get into it, they have to get, they have to see the whole picture because there's a tremendous shortage of officials everywhere in the country. And there's room at the top. Someone's gonna to be at the top. It could be these kids that wanna quit. You know, I almost quit. I, uh, my first year, uh, I worked seven or eight frost soft games and I thought I was wasting my time. And when the meeting came in, this, in the fall, my old coach called me, he said, where are, are you coming to this meeting? I said, nah, coach. I said, I don't think this is for me. He said, you get your fanny down here and you sit next to me and don't you ever tell me you're gonna quit. Well, I can tell you that I'm still with it because of him. I have his picture in my den, I kiss it. I blow a kiss every time I walk by him. He was the most wonderful man. He made my career just by what he said and his examples. You saying that actually led me straight into the next question, which is how important is it to have mentors as an official? And what words of wisdom do you have for individuals who serve in the role of a mentor? Well, it's so important because as I said, there are so many things that the meetings don't cover, uh, the rule book, uh, nothing covers all of the things, you know, 90% of what a referee, especially a head referee, 90% of the things that he does and has to do well are off the field. It's dealing with the 
with the office, dealing with the other officials, uh, worrying about all kinds of situations, planning meetings and everything else. The 10% on the field is easy. You know how to call fouls. Uh, you know how to handle yourself. You look nice out on the field. It's all of the things that go together. And the mentors teach you that. You sit, you know, uh, I am honored. Some of the finest officials, referees, Ed Hockley, maybe one of the greatest referees of all time, spent a day and a half at my house when he became a referee. And he said, Mark Bright, I'm here to pick your brain. He said, I want to be better than you. He said, I want more Super Bowls than you. And we sat and we talked about philosophy. Bill Carollo came. Mike Carey came. All, Bill Lamagne, who was one of the finest college officials. They all came. Why? I don't know. They wanted, they wanted my input. They made me feel so important. But I was only doing what my mentors did. The Howard Wurtzes of college fame and the Elliot Hassans and all of the, the Tom Kellehers and the fellows on my crew when I first got in the NFL. I knew nothing. I was like an embryo. How am I gonna, <coughs> how am I gonna call if I won't even know if I see one? You know, the mentors keep you alive. They, they're your teachers. You all, everyone goes to school, they have certain teachers that are so special. And these mentors, which is what I tried to fashion myself after, I wanna be a mentor, I wanna help somebody. I want to teach them something that nobody else is going to teach them. What was a failure that you had in officiating that you look back at and realize that it actually helped you long term? Well, you know, every mistake that you make on the field is a learning situation. And theoretically, you should never make that mistake again. And uh, I've called, I've, uh, I had a quick whistle uh, in a Notre Dame uh, LSU game and had to give the ball uh, to the other team because I had blown the whistle. And uh, the coach was Dan Devine and he came running out. And I said, coach, I said, you could kill me if you want to. I blew a whistle on the play and I have to own up to it. And he said, Okay, he said, I'm glad you're honest with me. And he walked away. I never forgot it. I felt terrible. And I did it. But I also learned from that, that there is no perfect. There's no perfect in officiating. You know, Jerry Seaman, who was the head of officials for, uh, for many years in the NFL, uh, he and I worked in the Big Ten together. Jerry always said, there's no perfect but you can, you can settle for excellent. And excellent is what I strive for, but a lot of mistakes. And every once in a while, you pull the trigger on a, on a flag and you say, oh boy, why did I throw that? And sometimes you can bail out of it and sometimes you can't. But remember, the most important part is an official sees something and makes a decision to flag it or not, they're positive that they're correct. And if it's proven on film that they're incorrect, then they have to eat that mistake and learn from it. But perfect, nothing, no perfect. I always thought that I was so terrific. Every time I thought I was terrific, I made, I'd get two downgrades in one game. And I think, but what happened to me? What did I do? Everybody makes mistakes. It's how you deal with it and how you accept criticism. It's the most, it's like being uh, in a big corporation where you have a performance review, except your performance review at officiating is on a weekly basis. And you've got to live up to that performance, whether it's bad or good. And at the end of the year, you're, gra you're graded. <laughs> 
the top graded person gets the reward and the, t the bottom maybe gets fired. So you're constantly onto the muscle to do a good job and to pre be prepared and do the best you can. Sometimes the best you can isn't good enough. And I believe me, I said a lot of prayers before every game. And I had that one prayer that I always use that I said, don't let me make a mistake that's going to cost somebody a game. And that was always my mantra. Don't let anything happen. Don't lose control of the game, no matter what happens. And you never know. Because the unexpected is the thing that you dread, fear, and expect. Because every once in a while, the unexpected happens, and you've got to deal with it. <clears throat> in, in all of your career, what did you find to be the most rewarding aspect of officiating? The most rewarding thing was the fact that I could do it that I actually could do it, that I could run a crew, handle the, all of the other things off the field and walk out onto a field and have enough confidence in myself to run this game with field presence and accuracy. <laughs> that was the most amazing part of it, being able to do it. If you talk to any big time official in any sport, that's what he'll tell you. The fact that I can do it, that I'm here. There are millions of people, maybe not millions, that would die to get to that spot. How did I get there? Well, you must have been good enough in someone's eyes to give you a shot. And once you have that shot, you got to perform. And I was able to do that for 23 years. And when I watch things now, watch games and see things that happen, I say to myself, boy, am I glad I'm not on the field today for this situation. I don't know how I would have handled it. But deep down in my heart, I know I would have been able to handle it. But I amazed myself by being able to do it. Uh, I worried every game and I, uh, I worried about every call. Uh, there's no easy road to top-notch officiating. And people say, oh, they're off there. <laughs> they just put a uniform, a costume on and, 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 and work for three hours. They suffer every, med, every mistake that they make, they suffer. No one wants to make a mistake. And when you have that, when you have that wonderful zebra outfit and you walk out on the field, you are the, you're the, controller of that game and you've got to see that it's played fairly and of course there therein lies a tremendous responsibility at every level even little kid games to those parents and the little kids and the, uh, the players it's the most important game of the day it's bigger than the super bowl for the seventh and eighth graders my first game, I didn't know how to keep my pants, uh, my socks from falling down. Nobody taught me how to, how to tape my socks and my pants and everything. It's a long cry from stepping out into a Super Bowl. But I did. Yes. <laughs> I did it. I don't know how I did it either. I did it. So you just said something that made me think of a story you told me once. Um, you know, there's so many differences in officiating now as opposed to when you started, even when you started in the league, you once told me about what you had to do to weatherproof yourself. What, what did that entail on an inclement weather day? Because I think this is such a, a fascinating thing in a world where everything is cold weather gear and under armor and of all of that stuff. <laughs> sure. Battery operated socks and all that. <clears throat> in my day, now that's from 1976 up through the 1998. Uh, on extremely cold weather, we wore the green garbage bags on our upper body with a hole cut for the head and the arms and uh, two gallon baggies 
against the skin of your feet covered by many socks and that kept you warm. And we had hand warmers in every pocket, uh, in muffs that we had. I mean, we died. We put cocoa butter on our face so that our face wouldn't freeze. I had games where my lips wouldn't speak. I would turn the, I turn the mic and I go, buh, 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 and, then, and someone for the press box said, what did he say? You can't even speak. You live through those games, you do it, and you improvise. You know, nowadays they have a cold weather gear and everything else, and it's high tech. We had it, nothing. We didn't have, there was, the high tech was a garbage bag. You guys were keeping hefty and Ziploc in business, so just for your cold weather games. <laughs> um, you were once asked, and I'm, I'm asking you some kind of random questions, but there are some of my favorite things you and I have talked about before. You were once asked by um, NASO and Referee Magazine, a six word memoir, what was yours? Well, it was simple. All of my best friends are officials. And I just thought, I said, I wonder if that's six words. I wrote it down, I sent it to Barry Mano, who was the king of uh, the referees. And Barry said, that's the best one we got. And, but it's true. All of my best friends are officials. People that officiate get it. People that don't officiate don't get it. You're one of the few people that I know that gets it. And even though you didn't officiate, you ran the officials. You felt for them. You understood what they what they were doing, and it's very hard. Uh, people that don't officiate don't know what to say to you. We'd go out socially, and they they wouldn't know what to ask me. You know, how's the don't how, how are the bears going to do? God, I'm so tired of hearing that. <laughs> so, I told my you know all of my great friends are officials. And you can work one game with an official and you're friends for life. And it's been a wonderful ride for me. A lot of my very, very, very close friends have passed on. And uh, I miss all of them because we had a constant chatter of telephone calls during every football season. what do you think about that? Was that a hold? Was that this? Was that that? I kind of miss all that. Now I have to call you and ask you if it's all right. Which I love it. Yeah, anytime, <laughs> anytime. You know, I'll take those calls. Um, if you could tell your younger self something to do differently as it relates to your officiating career, what would that be? Someone asked me once, uh, if you had to do it over, what would you do? I wouldn't do anything. I would do exactly what I did. I did painfully, all of the steps. I started in college, intramural. I started with the Benebrith Touch Football League after I graduated. I then went to freshman, sophomore, <clears throat> high school football, junior college, bigger college, Big Ten for 11 years, and finally into the National Football League a better path and a better learning experience from all of these couldn't have, couldn't have been more important to me. And had I advanced faster and gotten somewhere faster, I probably wouldn't have been as successful as I, as I have been because I paid the dues that all officials that are successful pay. I wouldn't change a thing. I may change a few things in my personal life, but my officiating path was guided by so many people. And uh, I thank all of them because they made, they made me into what I was and became. And you know, Norm Schachter, who was one of the great old referees, he worked Super Bowl one and three said, don't have any regrets when you retire. 
He said, it'll take people 10 years to figure out that you're not still working the Monday night games. He said, so don't worry about it. I have all of his leaves to send me these little cryptic notes. Uh, keep your eyes open. You missed the hold, I, but I didn't report it to the office and stuff like that. But that is good stuff. Uh, you've heard me talk for years about the importance of the officiating family, and you hit on that with your, your six-word memoir. Talk to me a little bit about the role of your family at home while you're officiating. And I know, you know, obviously I'm fortunate to know your wonderful wife, Bobby. Um, it, talk to me about how important it is to have a supportive partner, family, spouse back at home while you're out officiating? It, it's, it's, it's imperative that uh, you have support at home because officiating is a, a really a very selfish profession. It takes precedent over a lot of social things that you would have at home. You have to have the kind of wife and my wife who understands it and supported me all these years And, and felt bad for me when I walked in with a long face, knowing that things had not gone well, or that someone had called and said, you didn't see the game, did you? Jerry got knocked down and he was out. And, uh, and, 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 and I'm sorry I called you. And she supported me all these years. I've been married almost 66 years. Uh, she has put up with football, 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 and stuck with me. And made it possible for me to get up, pack a bag, and go away every weekend. Uh, a lot of the guys that are so really successful have great marriages as well. So the family support has to be tremendous. My daughters uh, were all very proud, but they were harassed at school when I made a bad call, and the kids were vicious, and they'd come home and cry, little kids and say, dad, why don't you quit officiating? They don't like you at grade school. So, you know, and, and, and once your career is done, nobody liked you. The only people that like you are your family and the other officials. So there are no coaches that are gonna stand up for you. Uh, you don't get fan letters. It's just one of those things. Wait a minute, I think I've sent you a fan letter. <laughs> I think I got one. <laughs> it was for me. <laughs> so I do have one final question for you. And this is, this is something to help me as you spoke about our shortage of officials. Um, a final question is, you have one opportunity to convince people to become officials. What do you tell them? Well, you know, we've had, I've had an opportunity uh, Every year when they have the Big Ten Championship in Indianapolis, the local officials association has a uh, clinic for prospects, high school kids, uh, kids in, uh, just out of uh, high school and small college uh, that are thinking about officiating. And Bill Carollo and I and a few other guys speak. What I tell them is you've got an opportunity of a lifetime. You've got something that you can do for most of your adult life. And you have something that you can contribute to this to society that's so important. You know, you know, you fellas and girls know how important sports are for everyone. Without officiating, there are no sports. Every sport has to have an official. You can be part of the big picture. Join the association, study, learn the rules, take every game you could possibly get. And someday you may be up here where I'm talking, convincing other young people to get into officiating because it's the best thing that I did in my whole life. The very best thing outside of my family. Officiating gave me rewards that all the money in the world can't buy. And 
every once in a while, you get five or six kids that decide to do it. And every once in a while, I'll be at a clinic and a, a, middle, a fella in his 40s say, Mr. Markbright, you convinced me at this clinic back in so-and-so, and I've been officiating for 10 years now. It was because of you that I, I've been officiating. I mean, those are the great rewards. There should be more clinics like that. Uh, Referee Magazine uh, and I have discussed the fact that they could run clinics for young people because without officials, they're, they're out of business too. And I think they have the ear of 40,000 people a month. There's, there's a way to get a young officials uh, and they got to do something because it's getting worse.